as we start today in the Word of God to see what it is that the Word has prepared for us in His Word, for God truly speaks through His Word to us. We'll be turning to Mark chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and skip over there in your Bibles or on your iPhone, Android phone, whatever device you use, we'll be in Mark chapter 6 and we'll be reading from verse 30 to verse 44. But before we get into that, I want to ask a question as we turn there. I would like to ask, just for a show of hands, of who likes to be abruptly interrupted? Anyone? There's not very many hands out there. I need to keep my hands down because I can't stand it. Um, what about online? You, know, you can comment below on our feed. There has to be someone watching online. Dylan, anybody commenting? You're shaking your head no. Does that mean yes? <laughs> so none of us like being abruptly interrupted. We don't like having our plans just thrown out. We don't like someone sticking a stick in the spokes of our bicycle wheel. That's something that I struggle with quite a bit. I mean, I, I struggle with it so much. I don't like being interrupted. I don't like plans not going the way that they're planned. Because what's the point in having plans if they don't go the way they're planned to go? There, there is no point, right? Today, this is what we're going to be talking about as we go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. And I do know that this is a passage I've preached on before here with our family of families, as well as a subject I've preached on before. But it's something near and dear to my heart because it's something that I struggle with myself. And I know many people struggle with this. We struggle with handling the interruptions life throws at us. I know I don't handle abruptness at all well. I, I struggle with surprise. Even if I know it's a good surprise, I struggle with surprises. This is just part of, you know, just my, how my brain just does not calculate that. And I, I'll be anxious and worried about, okay, what is going to be this surprise? You know, do, how do I need to prepare myself? Am I wearing the right clothes for said surprise? Good or bad, interruptions always send me for a whirlwind. But it's amazing how through experience after experience, through life interruption after life interruption, disruptions, closed doors, God continues to show me something. He continues to show me that he is present and he is moving in the midst of of the interruptions. In fact, that he is using the interruptions for his glory, for his honor, for his praise. That he uses every moment. And this is the reality for us if we are truly followers of Jesus. Not a moment of your life is laid to waste. Every moment matters. And God is moving in every moment. He is working in every moment, even in the bad moments. I think about back in 2017 when I was told I had brain cancer. That was a pretty big interruption in my family's life. But boy, God used it in such a marvelous and miraculous way. He used that interruption in so many ways, and in fact, to such a way that I believe we are here right now in Exeter, California, because of that interruption to our plans and to our lives, because so much changed then. Sometimes God brings the interruption even. I'm now I'm not saying God gave me brain cancer, but I'm saying that sometimes interruptions come our way out of God's provision and protection. When we're going off on our plans, our way, our life, how we want to live it, how we want to do it, God will sometimes step in to prevent us from making a big mistake. And I don't know if any of you can, but think back in your mind for a time that God has done just that. I can think back to many of times where God has done just that in my life. 
In fact, me and my mom were recollecting this past week as we were driving to the store together how we ended up here, how our family ended up here of all places, how it all started in a little town called Calton, Indiana. And why was it we left Calton? Oh, it was because the job that my mom was working was no longer available. They closed the school down that she worked at. So we moved further across southern Indiana. And, and then we moved to a little town called Lanesville. And all these things and these events that happened, these interruptions that wasn't part of our plans, eventually put me in a place called New Life Christian Church. And it was at New Life Christian Church where I would come to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But more importantly, it was at New Life Christian Church where I'd receive a call to preach the gospel in season and out, to correct, rebuke, and encourage. That wasn't my plan, though. That wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. But boy, God took those desires I had and he turned them upside down. All this to say, sometimes the interruption is God's provision. It's God's plan. It all comes down to this, though. How do we perceive the interruption? Is it an interruption or is it a divine invitation? An invitation to do something more, something bigger, something grander, to do something kingdom level, to serve and to live for Christ. Kingdom come, his will be done. This past year, we faced a major interruption. I don't think I have to say what the interruption is, but just in case you're wondering, COVID. Boy, how? That was a big one. And it still kind of is. It's important, though, for us as God's people to not let this moment fall silent, to not let this moment fall flat in our hearts we need to open our ears we need to open our eyes open our hearts and ask god what is it that you're doing right now lord how is it that you're speaking right now lord we're ready we're ready and willing and we are attentive show us lord how it is you would have us move right now because god is speaking God is doing something amazing in the midst of COVID. More importantly, God is moving. No matter the moment, no matter when, God is always on the move. The question is, will we be on the move with him? Or will we be too concerned about how we're interrupted? I think about this moment we're going to in Mark chapter 6, 30 through 44. And as we read this, I want to you to put yourselves in the disciples' shoes. Put yourself where the disciples are. They have been going to and fro across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, not the lake, the Sea of Galilee. They've been going back and forth, back and forth for many days now. Jesus gets them to one side of the lake after they fight a storm, and he says, okay, let's go back to the other side. And they get to the other side of the lake, and there's a huge crowd there. Okay, let's go back to the other side. A huge crowd gathers there. It's the same thing happening over and over and over again and boy are they tired they are exhausted and here they are on a boat going again across the sea of galilee and it says this in verse 30 the apostles returned to jesus and told him all that they had done and taught and he said to them come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going. And they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns. And got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. And the hour is now late. 
send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they said they had found I'm sorry. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. It says there's 5,000 men. It doesn't mention the women and the children. It is believed there had been somewhere between 8,000 to 9,000 people that would have ran out to the wilderness and been there at this very moment and this is the word of the lord and what a wonderful word it is filled with rich teaching and blessings and insights into who jesus is and what it is that jesus is capable of and who we are to be in him as imitators of him it would be good for us to lay the setting just a little bit more though before we dive straight into this passage. Once again, we have to understand why they're at where they're at. They went there to go on a retreat, to rest, to rejuvenate, to get restored. They went there to have some alone time with Jesus, Jesus and the disciples. They were going to have their alone time together. I can think of the, the disciples as they're paddling the Sea of Galilee again with their boat, thinking, oh, Gosh, I'm so sick of going across the sea, but we're just a few more miles down, down the way, just a few more miles, and we're going to be able to lay out some blankets. We're going to start a campfire. we got some awesome cakes of bread over here, a couple of fish, and we're going to cook those up, and it's just going to be a wonderful time with us and with Jesus. I just, I can't wait. You know, all these people have been crushing in on us, and if we notice the very first verse of our passage in verse 30 says that when they had returned they told him all that they had done because this happens right after the moment jesus sends the 12 out on mission to proclaim the gospel to proclaim the coming kingdom of god and boy do just amazing things happen There's a particular moment in the Gospel of Luke that captures this as well whenever Jesus sends out the 72, all of the followers, and it says this in Luke 10, 17 through 20. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, if you ask me, that's taking back what hell is soul. Something that we as the Church of God nationally have proclaimed as our purpose as God's people to reclaim that which hell has stolen and that's exactly what the disciples experience and that's exactly what the disciples get to do they work hard they they work long and they come back jesus you won't believe all the things that happened and i I could just see jesus like try me (laughs) try me i I know exactly what happened and, and and what you were able to accomplish in my name because it wasn't you it was me and my father who were working through you and prepared you just for this moment. But that's not the only thing that just happened. John the Baptist was also beheaded. John the Baptist was beheaded for his proclamation of Christ, his 
proclamation of a baptism of repentance over an ill-begotten promise made by Herod. And he's forced to, as we see in chapter 6, to behead John the Baptist, to present his head on a platter to someone as a gift. John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness to make way and to prepare the way for the Lord, a most servant, faithful servant, if there ever was a more faithful servant to Christ and his cause. It is here where we find in verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Jesus in this moment invites them to rest. Jesus in this moment invites them to process all that has taken place. The highs and even the lows. In this, Jesus invites them to mourn. That's why they go to a desolate place, which literally means a desert place. They're going out in the wilderness. They're going out in the desert. They're going where no one else will be for this particular purpose, to rest, to take a break, and to rejuvenate. They go out there to process all that has happened. And it's believed, geographically, this is located about four miles via the Sea of Galilee, eight miles by foot. So they kind of just cut a small corner of the Sea of Galilee. But we know it happens because we've read the story. The moment people see that familiar sail over the horizon, they begin just running. And it says they ran. They would have to run because they beat them there. They beat a boat that was going four miles, and (laughs) that's all it was going. They beat it there, and they traveled eight-plus miles to get out to this desolate wilderness place. I can see the disciples as they're rowing, not even paying attention to what's happening on the shore. They probably can't even see the shore at this point. But thinking, man, John just died for following Jesus. He was beheaded. When are they going to connect John to Jesus? And when are they going to make that connection to us? I can sense fear even in the disciples at the news of what happens to John the Baptist. What's going to happen Where is this all heading? They needed a break. I don't know about you, but I've uttered the words before, oh, I need a vacation. (laughs) Sometimes we just need a break. God created us even to take breaks, to take rest, to have Sabbath, to find rest in him. And boy, the disciples are looking forward to this moment. They're looking forward to going to this desolate place to be alone with Jesus, only to pull to the shore and to find a larger crowd than they left on the other shore. What are they doing here? This this isn't their place. Why are they here? This is our place. You know, we reserve this campsite, not them. Oh, the crowd was sitting and waiting for them. The whole purpose of going to this desolate place to get away was now ruined. Their plans just thrown out the window. And they pull ashore and Jesus gets out of the boat because it says when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. He, as in Jesus, the disciples are staying in the boat. They're ready to pull back out. They're ready to say, okay, this place isn't going to be good enough. Let's try to go somewhere else so we can be alone. Jesus gets out, though, it says in verse 34, and I can see the disciples thinking, good, he's going to send them all home. He's going to tell them that this is our time, not theirs. But it says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He does, as we said he does last week, he receives them right then, right there, just as they are. Jesus receives them. He receives the interruption. He invites them into his life 
and into what it is they're doing. He invites them into this moment, even though they are abruptly interrupting it. They weren't supposed to be there, but they are. And Jesus meets them right where they are. He doesn't say, now I came to get away from all you guys for a little bit. But since you're here, I guess we can hang out. No. He accepts them right then and there. He has compassion on the people. And we can't let the impact of this word here fall short on our ears. Because it's just like the word love in English. I love my wife like I love tacos. You know, we use the same word, but the word can have an emphasis and a deeper meaning to it. Because obviously, I love my wife a lot more than I love tacos. Although I do really love tacos. Um, The the, the point is, when the, the English says that he had compassion for them, the word here in Greek uses the word viscera as well, which is stomach. This was a felt compassion. It was deep in his gut. You know, you ever get those feelings in your gut? That's what Jesus has right here. And it's not a bad feeling. It is an aching in the sense of my heart is aching because they were lost and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus comes. And Jesus saves the day. Jesus teaches. Jesus cares for the people. Even though it wasn't the plan. It wasn't the purpose. It doesn't matter. Jesus moves regardless. And know that this deep felt compassion that Jesus had for this crowd. He has for you. He has for me. He has this deep felt compassion for all of us because we truly are all lost and helpless without him. We are sheep without a shepherd and we need the one shepherd, the good shepherd. We need Jesus. So time goes on and on and on. The sun is starting to cast shadows far eastward and the disciples think now's the time to get rid of all these people. So that we can have our time with Jesus. Peter, you got, you got the campfire wood ready? You got the fish and the loaves? Okay, good, good. Jesus, they say. They go, and when it grew late, the, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and to buy themselves something to eat. To buy themselves something to eat. They had something to eat. You know, the disciples, they prepared and packed their lunch. But as they look over the crowd, they notice that no one else has their lunch bag with them. They don't have those brown paper sacks with them. And they're like, well, this is our food, so let's, 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 Jesus, it's time to send the people away. And let's get back to what we were planning to do. But as the time went on, Jesus turns to the disciples, it says in verse 37, and he answered them, you give them something to eat and we can't mistake the second half of 37 here in the disciples response this is a rhetorical question they're asking they don't expect jesus to answer this question and this is a very disrespectful thing for the disciples to do even to jesus it's like and they said to him shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat you're crazy jesus like Any bean counter would know that this is just not the case. Where are we going to find that kind of food? Yet alone, who's going to pay for it, Jesus? I can see Jesus almost even turning the question on them. Well, you told them to go find food and eat. Where were they going to find the food? How were they going to pay for the food? Eddie Exeter forgot his wallet. We need to understand this is a rhetorical question the disciples ask. They're like, seriously, Jesus? Seriously? What you're asking for is just not feasible. Where are we going to find such amount of bread? Secondly, how are we going to pay for it? On top of all of this, we must remember they are in a desolate place. They're in the middle of nowhere. They're in the wilderness. And Jesus tells them to feed the 
crowd. Remember, about eight to 9,000 people. There are a ton of people here. You know, it's in the impossibilities of our situation where I find that God moves the most. Because whenever God moves in the impossibilities of our situation and makes what's impossible possible, there is no doubt. There is no doubt of where the power came from. There is no doubt of who accomplished the feat. And there would be no mistake, mistaking here who truly fed this crowd. And it's in this moment that the disciples receive an invitation of a lifetime if they would be willing to accept it. And that would be to actually truly be part of what God was doing in the middle of their interruption. Because they were planning to do something completely different. They're tired. They're hungry. They, they don't know why they're having to still work. And in the middle of this moment, in this time, Jesus tells them to go feed 9,000 people. Go play waiter now. They begrudgingly show Jesus that we do have five loaves of bread and two fish, but what are these for so many? And I can see Jesus as he blesses the bread and we hear the amen of the thousands of people that had gathered around them and they're thinking, we're not even going to get through the first group of people here. We're not going to get through the first group because remember Jesus divides the people up into groups and to sit in the grass. And so I can see the disciples carrying this basket thinking, this isn't going to go very far. And he lays it before the first group. And he goes back thinking, there's no more left. There's no more. And then there's Andrew handing him another basket from Jesus. It's like, what? Uh, okay, okay, I'll go to the next group. You know, we only had about enough food for us to eat. And basket full after basket full keeps coming from Jesus. A hundred are served, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 men not counting the women and children present. If this wasn't miraculous enough, imagine how miraculous and what the disciples thought when they collected more food at the end than what they started with. Because there was more food left over than what they started with. God steps in to this moment in the disciples' lives. Jesus steps into this interruption and does the most amazing thing. The disciples could have gotten back in the boat. And they said, Jesus, get back in the boat. We're going to go down a little bit further, hopefully get away from all these people. You know, Jesus, we're going we're gonna to go all the way to, to the country over, you know, to just get away from all these people. They could have done that. They could have been angered over the interruption. And they could have missed out on this great invitation that they are given by Jesus. Because this interruption is no interruption. It is a divine invitation to be the hands and feet of Jesus for this crowd, to serve and to love others. The ultimate question for us, though, today, would we, like the disciples, be willing to accept the invitation are we attentive enough to even know there is an invitation in our interruptions that we face in our lives when the door slams shut in our face? Are we attentive enough to what God is doing around us to even see how it is he would have us to respond? Just like we talked about at the end of our message last week, we need to be attentive to what God is doing around us and not just be attentive we also must be willing. For rest assured, he is calling us one and the same, just like he calls these disciples in the middle of their interruption. In these moments when things don't seem to go our way, he is moving, he is working, using everything for his honor, for his glory, for his praise. Would we be attentive? Would we be willing like the disciples in this moment, we must understand something very important about life. 
things don't go according to our plans. I think about the one thing I always teach a couple in premarital counseling, especially when we're planning the ceremony and we're trying to get all the details together. This person's going to move here and do this. Then the flower girl's going to come down the aisle and she's going to distribute the petals. I, what, what was it? The flower girl's going to dance down the aisle and she's going to dump the petals. And you're like, what? No matter how hard you plan this wedding, no matter how hard we, we plan and schedule out to the second, the ceremony, something is going to go not according to plan. And I want you to understand what I just said. I didn't say something was going to go wrong. Something's going to go not according to the plan. It's, it always happens. It, never matter, it doesn't matter how much you plan, something will always just go way off of plan. Don't let that disrupt what God is doing between you two that day. Don't let that disrupt the amazing and wonderful thing that God is doing by bringing you two together. And that's advice I give to every couple I've ever had the blessing to be a part of their ceremony. Because it's the truth. But it's not just with weddings. It's with life. Things simply just don't always go according to our plan. Things don't always go our way. The question for us today, though, is like the disciples, will we be attentive to see what God is doing? And will we be willing, even when it seems crazy? God, how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to manpower this? How are we going to do this? And in being willing, to lay aside our small earthly thinking to be a part of something that requires God. Church, so often in today's world, we live lives that don't require Christ. In the sense of we have our nest eggs, we have our protections, we have our safety nets. And we don't ever dare do something that would really require us to step over the ledge would we be willing to feed the 5,000 even when we say it's impossible think it's impossible see that it's impossible but knowing that it was God who was calling would we be willing to take that first basket full and to return expecting more knowing there will be more because our God is the God who does just that could we be attentive now during COVID, listening for God to speak, looking for God to show us where he would call us to be willing to serve him and his kingdom for his glory, for his honor, and for his praise. This is the word of the Lord, and the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen and amen. As we go into a time of response and reflection, let this be our response today. Lord, open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see, open our hearts to receive. What it is that you, O oh Lord, are doing, what it is you, O oh Lord, would have us do, how it is you, O oh Lord, would have us respond.